The following organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series. I know that the wetland may not look like much, but it's actually the home to hundreds of different species of wildlife. With a mix of grass and water, it's a great home for both land and marine animals. And it happens to be the home of one of my very favorite groups of animals. Oh, what group of animals is that? Waterfowl is a group of different water birds. So that includes swans, geese, and ducks. They're usually characterized by having webbed feet. They're really strong swimmers and they have waterproof feathers. Besides being really, really fun to watch, their story is actually one of the coolest success stories in American oh, conservation. Really? Yeah, because as weird as this may sound, hunting has actually helped improve duck populations and preserve wetlands. How is that even possible? Well, we'll keep discovering together as we go further into South Dakota and as we learn about how to play an active role in waterfowl conservation. Hold on tight as we go into, into the, the outdoors. outdoors. On today's hunt, we're taking Audrey and Hudson out on a youth duck hunt. Hudson's 12 years old, is his first duck hunt, and then Audrey, my daughter, who's 12 years old, and she's on her uh, second season of duck hunting. My whole family, we've hunted waterfowl my entire life, and I'm trying to pass on the tradition to my daughter. All right. So guys, we're gonna be heading down to basically straight south of us. We're gonna be wrapping around a wetland. It looks like a great morning. It's got a nice wind and nice cool weather, so we should be good shape. Okay, so Audrey, Hudson, and their dads are going out on a hunt to hunt waterfowl. But what does that have to do with conservation? Good question. It all starts with the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. The North American Waterfowl Management Plan, or NAWAMP, is a cooperative plan that manages both waterfowl and their wetland habitats across the North American continent. Why did this plan come into existence in the first place? Back during the days of European settlement in America, wetlands in the United States disappeared as a direct result of development. By 1985, nearly 53% of wetland in the U.S. had been destroyed. This caused populations of waterfowl to plummet. The North American Waterfowl Management Plan was then signed into existence in 1986. Under this plan, wetlands became protected from further destruction and helped reverse the decline in bird populations even to this day. Several years ago, the human user was, was identified as a co-equal goal with habitat and populations. We're managing not only waterfowl populations, but also hunter populations. Managing hunter populations? What does Rocco mean by that? I think he's about to tell us. Let's listen. Waterfowl hunter numbers have been declining in many states, including South Dakota, uh, really for the last 20 years. We've lost about 50% of our duck hunters since the late 90s in South Dakota. And one of the barriers that's been identified through numerous surveys has been identification of waterfowl and complexity regulations. In order to successfully navigate current duck regulations, as they've always been, is that you have to be able to identify ducks before you pull the trigger, which they're flying. Some of the main things are size, silhouette, even things like how many birds are in the flock. All those things are pretty specific, and it takes you know, a lot of experience to get the nuance of identifying ducks at a distance or on the wing in general. And it's especially difficult up here in the Dakotas or in the northern part of the flyway, where in the early fall, ducks are, are generally brown. They're not in their breeding plumage yet. So you don't have the normal cues where you would say, okay, that has a green head, it's a mallard. That has a, a pointy tail, it's a pintail. You don't have that this time of year because they haven't grown those feathers yet. I've been duck hunting for 
25 years now. And it's, it's certainly still a, a challenge for me in the first half hour of daylight to try to identify ducks. Ah, uh, so because it's really hard to identify a bird while it's flying before you could shoot it, some hunters may not even want to try duck hunting. Exactly, which leads to less people being involved in the sport and ultimately less dollars going towards conservation. So we've got about an hour before shooting time, so we're not in a big hurry. So you guys are going to be using your marsh seats in this, in this goose foot, which is this weed right here. So guys, what I'm trying to do here is place two main areas of decoys with a pocket in the middle is where we're going to put the, the motion decoy. So that's an area that we want the ducks to land. So we're going to set each hunter basically in front of one of the groups of decoys. And then in the middle is where we'll actually be trying to shoot the duck. A really key point about our, our hunt this morning was that we were on a state managed game production area. Those areas are purchased directly through license dollars as part of the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. Remember earlier when I mentioned that more people being involved in duck hunting leads to more conservation dollars? Yeah. Taxes from the sale of hunting licenses, firearms, ammunition, and gear all go towards raising money to preserve wetland areas like the one Hudson, Audrey, and their dads are at. I see. Although people hunt waterfowl, the money raised from that tax helps preserve the waterfowl's habitat, which in turn helps maintain healthy bird populations. Purchasing a license is, is one of the best ways that, that you can engage in the North American model of wildlife conservation. Those license dollars go directly toward conserving habitats and managing those populations. And that ties directly to the two-tier license system. Two-tiered license system? What in the world is that? <laughs> Relax. We'll cover that in just a bit. Let's check back in with the group and see how they're doing. Hudson, you're going to be down here. And I'm going to stand right back here in the edge of the trees. We set the decoys up, and uh, at first light, ducks started to fly, and they did not stop. Okay, get ready, guys. Birds coming into the left. Here's, here's, here's two, here's two. There you go, nice. Nice shot, Hudson. Yep. Thought I was just gonna hit one, but instead I hit two and I was shocked. Nice shot. It was exciting to have my dad with me while I shot those two ducks, cause it was, they were my first ducks. Two blooming teal. Yep. Better get hidden again. I was really excited and it was really awesome because it was my first duck of the season. I think I really liked watching my dog go out to get the ducks. She just did a really good job. Dang, Audrey and Hudson are pretty good shots. Yeah, but more importantly, they're taking their time choosing when to take an ethical shot and making sure they practice proper gun safety. Good point, guns are no joke. They should always be properly handled, even if they're not loaded. Hey, Gracie, on a side note, are we ever going to find out what this two-tiered system is all about? I'm glad you asked. I believe Rocco can break it down for us. This is the first weekend that the two-tiered system is being implemented, and I'm really excited to be able to watch the kids actually use it. Basically, you have two choices at the beginning of your duck season. You either choose tier one, which is the traditional license, which is six ducks, all the species and sex restrictions, or tier two, which is a three duck option, which makes it so you can just shoot three ducks of any sex or species without any other restriction at all. You can shoot any mix of any species of waterfowl during the regular duck season. It's just that many of those species have specific regulations attached to the species. So things like canvasback, uh, redhead, scop, all have specific limits within the six duck limit, which makes it challenging if you don't know your ducks. 
Everybody's been very supportive of, of this proposal and this evaluation plan. And it's really gratifying to be able to take my daughter out this morning and use this system, this regulatory system that, that I helped develop. There you go. Good job. Come here. Good girl. I think it was really cool that my dad created this and I get to try it on the first weekend. It feels awesome to be one of the first kids to do it, mainly because it just takes the stress off of having to identify the duck. The two-tier system relieved a lot of pressure from myself and it just made it so much easier for Hudson to be able to shoot and it gives them an opportunity to, to just hunt. Having Matt along, who is an experienced hunter, but not really an experienced duck hunter, bring his son Hudson with, was really nice because you know he, he was able to share that experience with his son without having to worry about him first going out and learning his ducks and, and allowing Hudson to grow into the sport at his own pace. You can shoot one more. You ready, Hud? We have ducks coming in from the left. Good job, Hud. <laughs> we watched Hudson shoot his first ducks today. Um, Audrey gained a lot of a lot of experience, and just watching Audrey um, kind of gain confidence through the day. I know she was struggling at the beginning with shooting, and and uh, settled down and finished strong. So that was really fun to watch. So now we're going to go uh, help Audrey and Hudson collect the wings. We're going to clean the birds and get them prepped for the table. We're going to share some more stories and and uh, recap the day. With the traditional tier one six duck option, a wing from harvested birds may also be required to be sent in for federal collection efforts to estimate harvest. If using the tier two three duck option, a wing from each duck harvested must be sent using the games and parks provided envelopes as part of efforts to estimate harvest. Harvest data is crucial to basically knowing what duck production was that particular year. We basically use hunters to sample the population to give us an idea of age ratios, harvest rates, survival. And that can come through things like wing collection, which is what we're doing here today for the two-tier experiment. Also things like banding data. The number of ducks killed and retrieved, how many did you shoot today? Three. So that's all we got to do for that. And then you just got to keep track of every other hunt we do this year. And at the end, we, you total these up and you mail it into us. Me, I learned some different kinds of ducks. I learned the blue wing teals, I learned the green wing teal, and I learned the shovelers and like what they look like. And I learned about how to tell the ages apart too with their tail feathers. You know, we talked about the tail feathers and mm -hmm. how they were notched and kind of ratty looking. These are all very nice, have a nice pointy tip, very high quality feathers. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know it's an adult. And then you look at one of the other things is the bill. And you, what do you see on that bill? Spots. Spots. That's a pretty good indicator of a female duck. Mm -hmm. What we're going to be doing is actually taking the duck wings from the ducks we harvested. Um, we're going to be putting them in envelopes and sending them into game fishing parks because we are actually analyzing the, the harvest composition of the folks that choose the three duck option and comparing it to the harvest composition of folks that have the traditional bag limit. Those wings will be sexed, aged, and ID'd and then used for, for analysis. And it's a really neat opportunity for folks to help um, make this system operational in the future. Duck hunting is a great activity for young kids and families to try. And it's a safe activity because you're not walking with guns. You're sitting in one place, it's very controlled. There's numerous public hunting areas. The water hunting opportunities are almost endless. One of the big misconceptions about duck hunting is that you, you need thousands of dollars of decoys and equipment to do it. All you need is a dozen or two decoys, a call, and a pair of waders, and you can be successful duck hunting in South Dakota. The only other main cost is the license, which is an expense, but it's also vital to the conservation of birds and wetlands and, and their habitat through the North American model of wildlife conservation. Those dollars go directly to conserving habitat and uh, managing populations. If you think your, your child has any interest in duck hunting, get, a, get a, a dozen decoys and a pair of waders and give it a try. It's not nearly as hard as a lot of people think, 
And especially if they are inexperienced, I would recommend, at least in, in South Dakota, where we have this option right now, to utilize the three duck option. It's a really fun way to connect with the outdoors and a fun way to, to connect with your family. What a great way to get outdoors and get involved in conservation efforts. Getting a hunting license and purchasing a duck stamp are both great ways for you to personally contribute to public wetland conservation. Public lands are an important piece of wetland conservation, but public land alone can't sustain duck populations. Rocco taught us how important the Central Flyway region is for ducks. And a large part of the Central Flyway is the Prairie Potholes region. What is the Prairie Potholes region? The Prairie Potholes region is a unique mix of grasslands and wetlands that stretches across Canada and the United States border to Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, and ends in Iowa and Nebraska. This region was formed 10,000 years ago as the glaciers melted and left these shallow pools of water. Now these wetlands are home to hundreds of species of wildlife. Sounds like this region is pretty important for wildlife. That must mean it's protected through funding from hunting licenses, right? Well, yes and no. A large part of this region is protected by conservation efforts, but also a large part of this region is owned by private landowners. Okay, so what does conservation look like on private land? That's a great question. Let's head back to South Dakota to take a look at what private organizations like Ducks Unlimited are doing to help preserve private wetland habitats. My name is Randy Meitinger. I'm a regional biologist with Ducks Unlimited. Been uh, working with the DU for uh, about 20 years now. So the Prairie Pothole region is just a, a very, very diverse landscape with uh, the mix of uh, grasslands, uplands, and, and uh, wetlands interspersed. Uh, the species richness, there's, there's hundreds of different uh, uh, birds, grassland birds, shorebirds, waterbirds, ducks, uh, game birds, uh, mammals, deer, and amphibians, it's just incredible. There's, and there's an equal amount of uh, grass and forb species out there. There's hundreds of different species of forbs out here as well. It sounds like wetlands are full of wildlife, but why are they so important for ducks? The shallow wetlands are really important for ducks to, uh, to get the aquatic invertebrates early in the year to the, where they can get the insects they need to uh, create their clutches. And as the hens uh, incubate their eggs and hatch the clutches. The more seasonal type wetlands that are a little bit deeper, those are, have warmed up enough where there's a lot of bugs and stuff for the, uh, for the broods to, uh, to take off. Sounds like a really healthy ecosystem to me. So what's the catch? So some of the threats to the, the landscape out here, the wetlands and the grassland, are uh, uh, tillage, plowing up native, native prairie sod and draining of the wetlands. With growing populations, farmers are expected to produce more crops so that you and I have food to eat. But some of these farming practices can hurt the native wetlands. We need the farms and we need the wetlands. So how can we have both? A good place to start is to identify what farmers, ranchers, conservationists, and wildlife all have in common. They all have a shared interest in grass and water. Farmers and ranchers need them to support their crops and livestock. Conservationists want to protect it for the sake of environment and wildlife. Wildlife relies on grass and water for their food and shelter. So it's important to make sure that grass and water are managed properly so that everyone can continue to utilize these great resources. I'm Brad Schmidt. I've been on the regional grounds with the DU and I've been at DU for about two years now. What we see is a lot of conventional tillage. So we, I mean, we see a lot of black dirt that's tilled up annually every, every fall and every spring. When we do that, is we're treating our soils almost like a catastrophic event because we have microbes and fungi and everything that are living in that soil that help us transfer nutrients to plants and bring up water to plants, everything like that. So when we go through and do these tillage events, what we're doing is it's, it's a natural disaster to that soil. Soil is full of microscopic life called microbes. These are things living in the soil that are so small that you need a microscope to see them. These microbes, such as bacteria, are essential for the health of the soil and the plants. Since plants are rooted in soil, they rely on the soil around them to provide the nutrients they need to live and grow. These tiny bacteria live on or inside live plant roots and can help the plant absorb nutrients. They even protect the plant from disease or drought. However, when the soil is tilled, the live plant roots that the bacteria were living on are ripped up. Without a home, these bacteria die and the health of the soil is depleted, so it's harder to grow the crops we need for food. 
we're all connected with soil because every single thing that we need to survive, food, air, and water, all originates from the soil. So if we're not taking care of the soil and thinking about soil first, we as humans, and it's not even just the ducks that aren't gonna have, have existence anymore, it's gonna be us as well. Because I think one thing that we forget about is, you know, us humans are not invisible. We're an animal just like everything else is. So we have to think about what we're doing in this world that's gonna impact for generations to come. I'm Jim Falstick, uh, a rancher from Central South Dakota. I've lived here all my life. Uh, my folks established this ranch back in the 30s and 40s. We had to change. Uh, we knew what we were doing wasn't sustainable. So we've, we've changed our priority from being uh, predominantly all about production at whatever cost there is to the environment to placing natural resources and to managing not only our operation, but the landscape. Ducks Unlimited has done uh, various um, um, research studies showing different types of grazing systems and grazing strategies are, are beneficial not only to the ducks, but also to the livestock producer. And it's better for the habitat. You have an increased uh, species richness and species diversity out there. So it's just a great partnership working with the ranchers out here. It's great to see organizations working with farmers and ranchers to come up with sustainable farming solutions to protect the wetland habitats. Ducks and Limited has many different partnerships. One of our most important partnerships is with private landowners. Private landowners hold most of the habitat in the Prairie Pothole region, and that's um, crucial to work with these individuals. We're very fortunate as an organization to have passionate conservationists that invest in our programs and they fully realize that we're impacting the landscape for waterfowl but they really appreciate how we do it by partnering with private landowners, government agencies and other nonprofit organizations. We can't do it alone. We need the partnerships and together we're going to make a difference for future generations. So we've, we work in partnership with uh, some federal agencies to secure conservation easements that uh, prevent the grass from being tilled and the wetlands from being drained. Those uh, easements still allow the landowner to utilize that land. You can still uh, graze it, cut it for hay. You can, if it's farmland, you can farm the wetlands when they're dry. You just can't, uh, can't artificially drain those wetlands. Wait, wait, hold on. I don't think I quite understood that. What is a conservation easement? And what does it have to do with conservation of wetlands? A conservation easement is what makes protecting private land possible. It's an agreement between a private landowner and a conservation organization. So what exactly do you mean by private landowner? A private landowner is anyone who owns land. So that could be a farmer, a rancher, a family, or whoever. The landowner agrees to let their land be used as a conservation area for that unique environment and wildlife that relies on it. This doesn't mean that the land is now a park or open to the public in any way. The private landowners still own their land. They just agree not to do certain things on it that might hurt the environment, like draining the wetlands. These agreements are a great way for landowners to keep their land, but also help preserve it for the wildlife that lives there too. My family and I decided to uh, do a conservation easement with uh, Ducks Unlimited. You know, we sat down as a family and started to understand that this is, you know, this isn't going to be open for public, that it would still be for the family. And that was the biggest thing for us, you know, is it's kind of a getaway place that the family can enjoy from grandparents down to grandkids. And the biggest reason we, you know, decided to, to go with that was because also the, being able to preserve the ground, increasing the, the forage, I think it's done all of that so far. Oh, I see. It's kind of like you're volunteering your backyard as a safe place for plants and wildlife. It's still your backyard, but also a conservation area for the environment. Exactly. Conservation easements with private landowners are vital to protecting the natural habitat for the wildlife's sake, but also ourselves. From a wildlife habitat standpoint, wetlands are very important. It's also important to recognize that wetlands play a vital role in things like improving water quality. They're great filters to, to improve the quality of water that flows through a wetland. 
They can help with uh, flood control and wetlands and recharge the groundwater, which is very important here. And they're also just great places to go and recreate. That's right. Not only do wetlands help improve water quality and protect against floods, they also act as a carbon sink. That means that they store carbon from the atmosphere by holding it in their plants and in their soil. Holding a lot of carbon helps restore the soil's health. This can help lead to better crop growth, resistance from drought, and even protection against erosion. Who would have thought that dirt played such a big role in keeping our planet healthy? I mean, that is one of our huge priorities and goals is to, to help educate our, our urban consumers uh, and recreators how important what we do uh, and managing grasslands is. And I think the younger generation has grown to appreciate where their food comes from. Water quality, carbon sequestration, and it's all important and there isn't anything does it any better than well-managed grasslands. Well, there you have it. Wetland habitats aren't just important for waterfowl and other wildlife, they're also important for us too. That's why it's so important to continue protecting wetland habitats on both private and public land so that we can preserve this environment for future generations. Yeah, you're totally right. These habitats aren't just weeds and puddles, they're actually full of life. And I admit, it has been pretty cool learning about wetlands and conservation with you today. And you know what? You should try visiting a wetland habitat next time you head into, into the, the outdoors. outdoors. organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series.